Welcome to Microsoft Defender for Endpoint from Zero to Hero, Module 1.1, Minimum Requirement and License. In this video, I will present what are the three flavors when it comes to licensing, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint P1, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint P2, and Defender for Business as well. And then I will dive into the hardware, what are the minimum requirements in order to implement MD. I will talk about all the Windows versions and operating system supported by MD. What are the two browsers you can use or you should use when implementing MD? Internet connectivity, where I touch base and talk about the differences between FIRO and proxy. And then some key information about data storage. And then finally, some key information when it comes to the configuration in regards to turn off Defender AV, turn off or turn on, onboarding, the difference between active and passive, and intelligence update as well. Anyway, let's dive into it. When it comes to licensing, there are three flavors you can choose from. Defender for Endpoint P1, Defender for Endpoint P2, or Defender for Business. Let me show the key differences between them. Starting with Defender for Endpoint P1, as you can see in here, we have the, the key cover, the next generation protection is included on this uh, subscription, attack surface reduction, manual response actions. Unfortunately, it's not an auto investigation. Anyway, we will get there. Of course, the centralized management throughout the security.microsoft.com, security reports, APIs, and, and support to Windows 10, iOS, and so on. Uh, please remember, Defender for Endpoint P1 is part of Microsoft 365 E3, okay? The next one, when we are talking about Microsoft Defender for Endpoint uh, P2, of course, we have everything available from the P1. And then on top of that, we have device discovery, device inventory. This is part of the threat and vulnerability package as well. Threat analytics. Very important, the automated investigation and response, okay, that can do, uh, um, you know, especially for the, the advanced, let's say, threats, it will do a deep dive investigation and can automatically close the, the alerts. Advanced hunting, very powerful tool as well. Endpoint detection and response, notification, and so on, okay? These are the key differences between both. Uh, in this table, you can use as quick reference. Please find the links on the video descriptions uh, below. Yeah, again, as you can see in here, it's starting from, uh, from this point, endpoint detection response, automated, uh, automated investigation, and so on, is only available from the P2. Please remember, the P2 you can uh, add or you can buy individually as an add-on, or if you have already Microsoft 365 E5, and then Microsoft Defender for Endpoint P2 is part of the E5 licensing. The next one is all about the Defender for Business. Please remember, don't get too excited. If your organization has more than 300 employees, and then unfortunately, you won't be able to be covered using Defender for Business. Defender for Business is something in between the endpoint P1 and P2. Actually, as you can see in here, it goes beyond the P1 with a kind of competitive uh, enough price. We have all the email protection, anti-spam, anti-malware, next generation protection, attack surface reduction, automated investigation, actually that's not available on the P1, vulnerability management, and so on, okay? These are for what Microsoft call for a small and medium size business as well. Okay, when it comes to the, the license for, oops, let me just go back in here. When it comes to the licensing for servers, can be a little bit, you know, uh, trickier. Anyway, please remember, if you have Defender for Endpoint P1 or P2, kind of standalone, or Defender for, for Business standalone, it doesn't cover licensing for servers, okay? Make sure you stay compliant. If you really has plan, if you have plan to start onboarding some Windows Server 2012, Windows Server 2016, Linux, and so on, and then you need to pick uh, one from those three different flavors. 
The first one is Microsoft Defender for Servers P1 P2, part of the Defender for Cloud offering. Okay, I have a, if you're not too familiar with Defender for Cloud, uh, yeah, basically Defender for Cloud is um, a bunch of components working together. Some of them is the Defender for Servers, the Defender for App Service, Defender for Container, Defender for Storage, Defender for DNS, and there are, I can't remember, maybe eight or nine different flavors. If you are paying already for Microsoft Defender for Servers and you, you have enabled the server component and then you are covered okay, from there. The other option is for you to buy the Microsoft Defender for Business Server. Okay, please remember, it's not a Microsoft Defender for Business, it's a Microsoft Defender for Business Server, and then you can start onboarding servers. Or you can add, you can buy and then add the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint for Servers. I know the names can be a little bit, you know, tricky, a little bit complicated, but these are the three options if you have any plans down on the road to a start onboarding servers and then please remember you need to cover you need to be covered with a license from one of those uh, three flavors okay moving on when we are talking about hardware the minimum let's say the minimum memory and minimum minimum cores you need as you can see the very minimum when it comes core it should be uh, two but the preferred option is four when it comes to memory again the very minimum would be one the preferred option is four. As I've done on my own lab and when implement, uh, implementing for clients as well, of course, it's possible for you to onboard servers. I've done that. I have onboarded servers with two cores, with <clears throat> only two gigabytes of RAM, and actually it works. But please remember, every time when there is a, a, a especially a fully scan running or an automated investigation where the system goes deep into the, the, the where MDE goes deep into the system, looking for every single registry key, for every single file, checking the files and so on. And then if you don't have the preferred harder, uh, hardware, uh, like four cores and four gigabytes of, of memory, and then I don't need to tell you, things will take, let's say, more time to be completed. Okay, keep that in mind. When it comes to the Windows versions, we are pretty much well covered. And on my own experience implementing uh, projects, I've been working on Windows 10 and Windows 11, then there is no compatibility issue. We are using the latest technology, the latest kind of updates when it comes to the MD. There is a support for Windows 8.1 and Windows 7 as well, but to be honest on the projects I've been in, uh, implementing, I'm not, or let's say we are not uh, uh, onboarding the old version. We want to make sure we use the latest version to, to get the latest ca capability. When it comes to servers, we are covered from server 2008 R2 to Windows Server 2012. Based on my experience, I've been onboarding servers 2012 R2 and newer because they are using the latest client available from Microsoft that covers the EDR, AV, and everything you, you need. Uh, in theory, we can onboard server 2008, but this is based on an old client and it doesn't provide the full, let's say, security capability comparing when comparing with server 2012 and 2016. My option is to stick with 2012 and newer. Moving on, um, initially Microsoft started supporting MDE only for Microsoft Windows, but for the last two, three years, Microsoft is investing uh, a lot of money in order to bring the other platform into the MDE as well. Today we can onboard and we can manage via MDE all the Mac OS, Linux, Android, and iOS as well. Please make sure, especially when we are talking about Linux, I don't want to say, and I can't guarantee, every single flavor from Linux can be onboarded. The most popular uh, distro, as uh, of course, they are supported by Microsoft. But before getting getting too much enthusiastic, just double check if you have, I don't know, Red Hat version 6, Red Hat version 7, SUSE Linux, uh, Fedora, whatever are the, the flavors you are using. Just make sure, double check with Microsoft if they are fully compatible. And Microsoft is doing a great progress in order to do the management on those uh, platforms as well. When it comes to browser, as you might know at this stage, 
all the management when it comes, especially from the kind of backend configuration, must be done via security.microsoft.com. And then no problem at all when using Microsoft Edge and, uh, or Microsoft Google Chrome. To be honest with you, I've been using time by time uh, for, uh, Firefox and I haven't seen, I can't remember actually any problem I faced with that browser. But, you know, to, to stay, let's say, with Microsoft best practices, I would say Microsoft Edge and Google Chrome are fully compatible when doing the MD management. Data storage, that's very important as well. When you run the initial, the initial setup, the initial wizard, part of the wizard is for you to pick where actually you want to save all the data, all the, everything that is happening on your devices uh, into the data centers on EU, on UK, or in uh, America, okay? These are the three options. By the time I'm recording this video, there is no way for you to change the location when you complete the wizard. Okay, if there is a mistake or if there is, you know, you pick the wrong location or whatever, you know, things can change in the future. Even I'm not too sure if you can talk to Microsoft to change the location. But from the, the, the portal, it's not possible to do that. Okay. Um, you might be wondering, in, in my case, when I'm installing and implementing Defender for Endpoint, I'm coming across some very busy servers, some kind of Linux servers, some Microsoft servers, generating more than a million transactions a day. And then, of course, all of those transactions, they are uh, uploaded into the, into the storage, the data storage on MDE. And then a question I had a while ago is, you know, how big is this storage? The good news I have for, uh, to, to share, again, based on the time I'm recording this video, there is no limit. If you have 100 server or 1000 servers onboarded, and if they are generating very few telemetry, or if they are generating millions of uh, telemetry uh, every day, it doesn't matter. It's part of your subscription. You don't need to be worried, you know, how much space that is going to take from your tenant or, you know, from the, from the data storage, okay? Just keep in mind, you can change the location. Another important uh, uh, thing here to consider is for how long you want to keep the data, you know, all the alerts, all the transactions happening on every single app, on every single device, for how long you want to keep. By the time I'm recording the video, maximum is 108 days, it means half a year, but you can start with 60 days, 90 days, 30 days, 60, 90, and then eventually going to uh, 180. Okay, again, that depends your own, let's say, setup, your own organization. In general, more means better. Eventually, you know, after 30 days, 60 days, if you need to go back and retrieve some information that happened in a particular device, you know, any, any uh, date, you can go back at least 180 days. Okay, keep that in mind. And as I said, especially from the location, there is no way we can change that. Okay, when it comes to the internet uh, connectivity, of course, MDE is fully cloud-based. Somehow the devices, they really need to reach the, the Microsoft data centers to reach, you know, URLs like this, uh, crl.microsoft.com and so on. There is a bunch of, of URLs they need to reach. And then to do that, there are basically two ways. The first one is for you to allow the direct connection. As you can see from here, basically the devices, they will go through most likely a firewall, but the firewall basically, thanks to the, 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 the rules, will allow those devices, can be Windows 10, Windows 11, or servers, they will allow those devices to communicate to the portal <clears throat> to send all the telemetry. Some organizations, they are using proxy, Okay, proxy, based on my experience, it can be a little bit uh, trickier because the communication is not straight like the firewall. The communication is kind of, you know, two stages. The endpoint is able to connect to the proxy server and then the proxy server basically goes out to the internet and connects the Microsoft data centers. Very important, in order for you to implement MDE using proxy, please uh, review all the, the requirements. Two of them, two of very important requirements are 
the, the communication must be unauthenticated, uh, okay? It means the device should be able to go out without doing any user and password authentication. And the proxy uh, should not do the TLS inspection as well. Of course, I'm not talking about user data. I'm talking when the device is communicating to the Microsoft data centers, to the Microsoft Defender, uh, Defender for Endpoint cloud service, the traffic must be unauthenticated and no TLS inspection okay, should be done here from the proxy. I have other videos to talk about FIRO and proxy and you know, in those videos as well, I run demo in order to use the endpoint client analyzer tool. Eventually, if you are facing some difficulties and it looks like, it looks like the devices are not able to reach the all the Microsoft data center. Yeah, please run the endpoint client analyzer tool to find out what are the, the URLs blocked by your FIRO or by your proxy. But mainly these are the two options when it comes to the internet connectivity. When it comes to the configuration, again, there are other videos where I go much deeper to explain, but the key ones are here. First of all, especially if your organization is using a third party AV like Symantec, McAfee or you know, whatever is the third party tool, usually or sometimes those uh, third party AV, what they do, they disable the Defender AV service throughout this policy. Turn off Microsoft Defender antivirus basically is enable. Okay, that force the Defender for Endpoint to, to, to keep disabled. And then by the time you try to onboard or to try to enable Defender for Endpoint, you will get some serious headache. What's happened with me and some of uh, the other projects? What you need to double check or need to make sure this option turn off Microsoft Defender for Endpoint in a grow policy level or a, a, a local policy is set as not configured or disabled. Okay, make sure you disable, uh, you set as a disable to allow Defender for Endpoint to start. Okay, when that step is configured, the next step is uh, do the onboarding, because of course I need to register my device into, my, into the Defender for Endpoint cloud service. Another thing is to set the Defender as active or passive. Please have a look on the video where I'm talking about how to migrate third-party AV to Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. To be fully protected via Defender for Endpoint, the configuration should be active, okay? But if you are using a third-party tool and then a third-party AV like McAfee, Symantec, or so on, and then the idea is first to onboard the device as a passive, give a couple of hours or you know, say one or two days to make sure all the telemetry, everything is fully onboarded, everything is fine. And then when you are doing the switch, we switch the, the AV, the MD as active, and then we uninstall the third party tool. Okay, I don't want to provide too much detail now. Please have a look on my video where I do a kind of deep dive into migrating third party AV into MD. And the next one is the intelligent updates. Of course, everything in these days is based on cloud, but we still need to have a client, the platform fully updated and the AV definitions fully updated as well. Those updates, they can come from a local data source like WSUS or System Center, or if you want, you can configure the, the devices to retrieve this information, all the AV updates and so on, to retrieve this information straight from uh, from the, the, cl uh, the cloud, okay? Please have a look on my other videos where I explain and show how to do this configuration. Anyway, that was my module 1.1, minimum requirement and licensing. I hope you enjoy. If so, please give a quick like, subscribe my channel and get ready for the next module. Thanks for watching.